I have to know who he is, not who you are or who that church is, because that's not where my strength is coming from. It's literally coming straight from him. And even my husband is like, you know, stuff that even I don't know. And I've been walking this walk forever. And then that's even a little scary. So I definitely am in this experience with the Lord and what he's trying to do in me, which is not what he's doing in you, not what he's doing in my neighbor. Hey, Roar Nation, John Fuller here. And before we get started today, I want to share with you one major thing that has made a difference in my life, and that's working out in nutrition. So besides staying mentally fit, it's important to take care of your body, right? And that means having more energy and more focus throughout the day. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have really long days, and I need every advantage that I can get to keep up with my three kids. So my wife, Casey, has created an amazing online program that walks you through step-by-step how to work out and what to eat. The best part about it is she's taken out all the guesswork and what to do and how to do it. She shows you everything. She shoots videos, answers questions, walks you through the whole process. And honestly, the best part about it, besides the last thing that I said, is it's less than $20 a month. I don't know of anywhere you can get such an amazing program for less than $20 a month. So if you will go to our website on areyoureal.org, you'll see a banner on the right side of my beautiful wife. And if you will click on the banner, it'll take you right where you need to go to get started. And the way we've done that is we've created it all through Facebook. So all you have to do is click on there and it will walk you through and put you into a small private Facebook community. And also all the time I get questions about supplements, what to take, how to take them, do they really work, and we've taken care of that also. If you will send me a message through our website or through Facebook on Are You Real, I will gladly send you some samples of my favorite products that I take every day that help me stay focused and full of energy. So again, Facebook me, private message, send me an email, I will send you samples for free to help you get started. Jump on there, click on the link, send me a message, and we just want to get you mentally strong, physically fit, and for you to be the best you you can be. Have a blessed day. Welcome to Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You, the podcast that focuses on Christians that are active in everyday life. Join in as we speak to everyone from successful business owners to educators to athletes about their faith and how it helps them reach out and revolutionize those around them to do the same. And now, get ready to roar with your host, the voice of manifestation, John Fuller. Welcome to Are You Real? Episode 14. Hey, Roar Nation, John Fuller here, and I am excited, stoked, whatever you want to call it. I don't have another word for it, but I'm super excited to introduce today's special guest, Phaedra Koenig. Phaedra, are you fired up and ready to roar? Dude, I am muy caliente. Yeah! Okay, so Phaedra is an Amazon best-selling author, podcaster, and lover of Starbucks. Phaedra is determined that no one facing a crisis feels alone. Known in pop culture as America's crisis coach, Phaedra works high achievers who have faced unimaginable obstacles and want to come out on top. Her bold approach to crisis management is out of the box and changing lives. That's what I'm talking about. You can find out more about Phaedra at doinglifewithphaedra.com. You can find her books on Phaedra on amazon.com. Catch her podcast coming out of the fire on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. All right, Phaedra, we have barely dove into how awesome of an impact you're making in culture. I want to dive in a little bit more and talk about your career, your life, and your how that intertwines with your passion for Jesus. Mm, awesome. Okay, so my career. So I have about 23 years in the fields of social work, mental health, and family court services. So I've worked with thousands of people over that career who have been going through the worst times of their lives. As far as my life, I am currently an empty nester enjoying that next phase of life. My daughter is getting married in two months. Super excited. So I'm all in the thick of wedding planning. Woohoo. Yeah. So life is good. I'm a transplant. I lived in one area in Northern California for 46 years and I upped and I moved to Sacramento, which is a little bit farther south for me. And I have been here for just over a year and I love everything about my new life. 
Awesome. I love it. So you talk about empty nesters. I can't even imagine right now. I have three kids. I have one in high school, one in junior, one in elementary. And I feel like my wife and I are going 100 miles an hour in every direction. Get up early, go to bed late. So I'm assuming that was the same for you at that point. And now you're kind of enjoying a little bit of a break. You know, that was my life, and I miss those days tremendously, and it's interesting. I am definitely in a season, and I know we're going to be talking about that, but one of the poignant parts about that is I say that I feel like a sheepdog without a flock, like I have all this energy and all this ability and all this desire and nothing to do with it, so it's a little bit of an interesting time. Well, it's definitely going to be coming out soon, so I'm excited for you. Okay, so, Phaedra, what has been an inspirational quote or success, a success quote, one of the two, that has really guided you? Let's just say, because I know we're going to dive into these last couple years. So what has been something, scripture quote, that has really pulled you through these last couple years? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as we go through seasons of our lives, those scriptures and those quotes ebb and flow. But right now I am living strongly in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, which is lean on, trust in, and be confident in your Lord with all of your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. Love that scripture, but I want to ask you this. So I don't typically ask this, but what does that look like in your life. So every day, great scripture, lean not on your understanding, rely on the Lord. But how do you do that? Right now, it really applies because in the natural, my life looks really tough and it is really tough. I am walking a walk that's unusual. It's out of the box and it's new and groundbreaking for me. I don't know anybody who's ever been in through like it, anything like it, even though there are people, I haven't necessarily met them. So in that situation, for me, it really is about knowing that I don't know all the answers. I can't rely on my own brain power or my own idea of what this is supposed to look like. I really do have to lean on the Lord. I really do have to let him show up so I know that he's sovereign. Because if I were figuring it out, I would attribute all the success to myself. Absolutely. Is there days where you just literally have to focus on the word or focus, like meditate on that scripture? Because I think all of us get to a place where things get really hard and you do just have to sit back and say, okay, Lord, you have this. So is that daily for you, hourly, weekly? I mean, how is that for you? Well, it's interesting because I am what they call a later in life Christian. So I didn't come into Christianity until about the year I was about 43 and I'm 47 now. So maybe earlier, maybe more around 41. And so I am taking in, it's like I'm getting just infused and downloaded with what could have been coming to me over the course of my life. I've been getting in these few short years. And so God is just really taking me on this amazing, fast-paced journey. And so because of that, yes, I am so in the Word. I am so in a culture and community of just absorbing. And there are days where I have literally only just studied the Bible or only just been thinking and trying to connect and understand how it is that I personally hear from God. And I've definitely been connected to some powerful spiritual counselors, Christian counselors that are really helping me kind of put all of this together from the Christian's perspective, because I walked in such a different world for so long. And it's really important because I'm wanting so much to understand this from his perspective. So it's definitely sometimes an hourly, sometimes a daily. And every once in a while, I get a bit of a break and I feel like I can just unplug for a little bit until I hit church again on Sunday. Yeah, I love that because, you know, I don't think we come into it late. We come in, into our walk with Jesus just in time. And obviously you were just in time and he's just going to download and infuse you with everything you need for the right moment. So I'm excited for you. So let's talk a little bit about your life journey. You talked about, you said 23 years. Is that correct? Yes. So what brought you down that road to get into what you're doing, but then transfer over into how now that you're walking with Jesus, so you said these last four or five years, how that overlaps, because I'm assuming you come at it from a little bit different perspective now. Yeah, absolutely. So in the beginning, going back to my childhood, my mother um, had me as a teenager and deciding not to have an abortion was probably the only positive decision she made as far as my life went. And so from the time that I was three until I was 13, she was married and my step parent sexually and verbally and physically assaulted me for that whole decade. So from three to 13. 
So I've lived on my own since I was 16 years old. And when I went to school, where I lived in Northern California, there weren't a lot of options. If you were to have gainful employment, at least from my perspective, you worked for county government or you were a nurse or you were somehow, you know, in the first responders, maybe a teacher or something like that. And when I went to college, I um, definitely fell into the hmm, psychology sure is helping me understand myself. And so I studied psychology and it was a natural fit for me to go into social work. So my original drive was really about helping, especially teens who were living with the effects of abuse and trying to come out of that. And I worked with families and I really loved working with teens who were not benefiting from public education because there was so much going on in the home or in their mind or with mental health. So yes, initially I was driven by that. And the, the great thing was that getting degrees and in, in psychology and really studying that, I was able to really transform my own life. And I could have been a train wreck and I wasn't. I became a great mom. I was married. My first husband, we got married very young. And unfortunately, mental illness was part of his path. He didn't know it. I didn't know it. And I became a single mother before most of my friends had ever even been married. So here I came off of that experience as a child, living on my own and then marrying and having a husband who could no longer parent or be married. So then I married again, was married for 10 years, and my husband had an affair with one of my closest friends. And I want to be all, hey, it wasn't fair, you know, poor me. But really, I went there in the beginning. But as I moved through it, I really realized that It takes two. And I had brought a lot of baggage, as great as I thought I was, from my childhood, from that previous marriage. And I have to be honest, he and that gal have been married for over 13 years, and they have a very solid marriage. So I, again, worked through those issues, you know, about having this failed marriage and really dug deep and even ramped up even more and how I was able to show up in the world, serve clients. I started blogging before it was really a thing and I was able to get some traction. Well, I was single for a very long time after that, raising my daughters, keeping my head down, just trying to do the right thing. And in about in 2008, I opened up my heart to dating again. And now at this time, I had achieved quite a bit of success locally. I worked for a nonprofit as an executive director of a housing program who served people who are chronically mentally ill. I also was working as a court investigator, which is a job that I absolutely loved. And I was getting traction in this thing called blogging, which was really new back then. And so things were going really, really well. And I opened up my heart to dating and I met somebody and we really clicked. Our families really clicked, which for me was a really big deal. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but he was going through some pretty tense stuff legally. And he was fighting against the state of California for some accusations. And I don't know at what point we want to get into that. But the reason that I bring that up is because we ended up committing ourselves to one another and walking through that walk together and going through that walk and everything that came of it really transformed myself. My husband was a Christian and we're married now, surprise. (laughs) And watching him go through his walk really impacted me. And it brought me to wanting what he was having, essentially. And I ended up saved. My children ended up saved. And I call it my Lego moment. I remember hearing kind of this snap where when you put a bunch of Legos together and it's like everything I knew before and everything that I was learning now was all snapping together. And so in that twist and with everything that I had gone through, I really started to up my game and working with people who are going through intense amounts of crisis. And so now I work with people who are going through really, really traumatic experiences and helping them solve problems, understand what's going to happen, deal with any social issues and really get their heads back on straight so they can move forward and come through the fire, as I say on my podcast. Awesome. Man, there's (laughs) there's so much you just said. I'm taking notes as we talk. We're going to dive deep into your situation with your husband, because I think that's going to qualify for a worse moment. But real quick, you talked about your second marriage. And I love what you said, because I literally did a live Facebook feed last night talking about owning your crap. 
And there is a book called Extreme Ownership. I think it was written by a Navy SEAL. I just read it. But you talk about owning that. Do you think for you, and maybe you would understand from a psychology standpoint, but that set you free to some truth and allowed you to get free once you owned it, your side of it, not just blaming. It was able to set you free into what you were obviously to move forward. Owning it was halfway there. Owning it was me looking at my own crap and what I contributed to that and knowing that I had choices moving forward. I could drop any crappy habits that I had. I could become more self-aware. I could become a better person. And that would ensure that anyone I was in a relationship with in the future would get the best version of me that ever existed. But that was half the battle. The other half was he you know, contributed. Right. He definitely made choices. And certainly my girlfriend made choices that were really unsavory and went down in a way that was not cool. And I needed to learn how to accept that perhaps I wasn't going to get the justice that I felt I deserved. I wasn't going to get the apology. I wasn't going to get, you know, the restoration that I wanted or expected. And coming to terms that I didn't have to have that in order to move forward and live a full, healthy life, that was the other 50%. So the two combined is what set me free. I'm just so glad you said that, Phaedra. I grew up a lot like you did. I've had a lot of bad circumstances happen in my life. And when I get around people, I hear people say like, well, woe is me or poor this or this happened or my parents did this, all these different things. But when you come to grips with I have a choice and I can move forward, I can forgive, doesn't mean I have to forget, but I can forgive and move forward. It really makes a huge impact. So I'm assuming that's really been a huge shifter for you moving forward in your life is forgiving. Yeah, because at that stage of my life, I was a pretty judger. I mean, I didn't believe that I was, but I totally was. And now where I am now, I mean, I can even embrace both of them at a very different level. As I said, our daughter's getting married in a couple of months. And we unfortunately never were able to come to that place where we could happily co-parent. You know, it's really difficult when it's your friend. You know, he's married to your friend. So that's kind of bizarre. And when people come together through infidelity, there is a sense of, you know, secrets and brokenness. And so it was always difficult for us to come to a place of, hey, we're all in this together. We're all going to co-parent together. And so it's been a challenge for my daughter. But what I've noticed with this wedding is it really has brought us together in a way of Team Megan, what do you want for your wedding? And some of that animosity has gone away. And I will say that the way that my ex-husband's wife is respecting the fact that I'm the mom in this situation. I'm the mother of the bride. It has softened my heart somewhat towards her to where I don't feel so, you know, defensive or so guarded as far as her being at the wedding and how are people going to perceive us and how is it going to be for Megan? I feel a lot softer to that and I'm excited for that. Yeah, that's just a lot of emotional stuff to work through. I'm just thinking about that as we talk. I want to ask you, so in the notes, I talk about seven mountains. Uh, If you're not familiar with that, that is in every culture we talk about. There's business, religion, family, education, government, media, arts, and entertainment. Where do you feel like you're really concentrating in those mountains to be that light on top of a hill? Absolutely religion. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, how? It's interesting. I appeal to what I call fence-sitting Christians. And they're people like I was, people who have heard of God, obviously. If anything, they're in Walmart at Christmas, right? They see the yeah. reference, right? Okay. They so, heard the Christmas carols. Right? So these are people who want to believe, and like I did, had head knowledge, but no personal walk, no personal commitment, and therefore no Holy Spirit, and no nothing that I've experienced on what I call the other side of the fence. These people want to believe because they're so hungry and, you know, we have a seed in us that knows and they are troubled. They are full of what I call the yeah, buts. Yeah, but, you know, I know it works for you. Yeah, but this. And I have such a heart for them. And in this experience I've gone through with my husband, I've been very transparent with it and very kind of out there. And so people have literally seen the transformation and they know it's genuine and they know that I have changed. So people are coming and asking more questions and they're not as afraid because they feel like they're approaching their own kind, so to speak. You know, on my show, I never believed in a million years that my show was going to become a ministry and it has. 
I just wanted to showcase people who are going through the worst time of their life and came out the other side so they could model that behavior for people who are in the fire right now. And consistently, people are coming on in our pre-chat are saying, is it okay if I talk about the fact that God played a big part in this? And what I'm hearing is that they're being asked not to talk about that on other podcasts. And because I'm embracing that, and because we're having these conversations, and because some of my people cuss a little, they might have a beer, they might do these, quote, things that my fence sitters are going, wait a minute. You don't have to be straight edge. You don't have to be sister super Christian. Wait a minute. You can do these things and love God and he loves you. Wait, I want to know more. So that has become the theme of my life over the last three years. And it's just been phenomenal. And I often say, I have no idea how God is using this story and me, this broken, dirty girl. But all I know is that I'm willing and I will do anything that he's asking and I'm walking towards him at all times. And it's just been amazing. So, yes, my mountain is definitely religion. I like that. I love the transition you're making. I want to ask you this. You made the comment earlier when you married your husband. You said you wanted what he had. And then you go on this last comment you talked about that people are asking you. They want to believe what was it that you saw in your husband and what is it that people are seeing in you that is causing them to get off the fence and say, okay, maybe I can believe why. Absolutely. So in order to do that, I feel like this is the great time to share my story. Are you cool with that? Yeah, let's do it. Oh my gosh. I feel like I'm being bossy. No, this is your show. Let's do it. So here's the deal. All right. And you'll understand why, as I tell this story, as I said a moment ago, I opened up my heart to dating Long comes this great guy, this amazing guy who is the most charismatic man I'd ever met. And as you can probably tell from me, I have a pretty big personality. And to meet my level of energy and intellect and all that, it takes a pretty big personality to match me. And that's one of the things that I noticed about him right away. So as I said, when we started dating, he was very open that he was going through some, quote, stuff. And what we didn't know at the time was in California, this was eight years ago, the attorney general was running for governor and he wanted to look really tough on white collar crime. And this is when Bernie Madoff was in the news and other people for hedge fund stuff and all that sort of thing. So California indicted over a hundred people for various white collar crimes. An example would be maybe they'd say a cardiologist, you know, did frauded medical. And so they put you under investigation. And typically what you do is you fend off the attack, you settle out of court and you move on with your life. Well, my husband had been a prominent businessman and he was like, I didn't do anything wrong. And he had amazing attorneys. You know, he had all the structure of his business there behind him. And he was working with the state to say, "Okay, you're saying that I did, but here's the proof that shows that I didn't. And they were working back and forth and all the attorneys and everything were saying, oh, everything's going to be fine. You know, you have what you need, blah, blah, blah. Well, essentially, the state wanted him to take a deal. And when he wouldn't take a deal, they put him in jail for two and a half years and they tried to force him to take a deal. And the way that they do that is by putting you in jail, taking all your possessions, taking all your income, taking all your reputation and asking, are you ready to take a deal? And when you say no, they say, OK, well, your honor, we need six more months to you know, go figure out what we're going to do and come back. So essentially, you're sitting there in jail, you know, being whittled down until you feel that you're ready to take a deal. Long story short, he refused and eventually the county forced the state to either move forward or reduce his bail to a reasonable amount. And so they did that. Then he was home. Okay. Okay. So you're talking about your husband right now, but at this point, have you surrendered to Jesus or have you gotten saved? Whatever you want to call it. At that point, do you know the Lord? Yes. Okay. Just take that chunk of time. Okay. Okay. And you talk about, do I want what Jim's having? Yes. Here's what I know. When this was happening to Jim, and at the time we were dating, his ability to say, I don't know what's happening to me. I am literally losing everything I have ever had, ever built, ever known. But God is good. And it was just the most amazing thing. And to see the amount of stress and pressure on this guy, not to say that he didn't complain, because trust me, it was horrible what he was going through. And yet his steady ability to love the Lord and what happened even in the jail is the incidence of aggression started to reduce. He started having Bible studies. People were getting saved. One of my very favorite stories 
was a guy was convicted, given a life sentence. The guy had been working with Jim, just listening to what Jim had to say. And he says, I didn't do this. And he says, I don't have answers for you, but I can sit here with you in this moment. The guy was shipped off to prison, life sentence. Jim never thought he'd ever hear from this guy again. The day after Thanksgiving, so this is months later, they're like, hey, you've got a visitor. He knew it wasn't me because I was out of the area. He goes to see this visitor and it's that guy. The guy had gotten shipped off to wherever and at some point exonerating evidence was found and his case was dismissed. And he took the time to go through the process to come back and be able to visit Jim just to tell him you were right. And it was amazing. So, yes, I'm watching that. My daughters are watching that. I got saved on my couch. I don't know if you know who Bill Cornelius is. He was you do or you don't. Okay. He was on television a lot. I really like him. He's got Bayside Church, I think, in Corpus Christi, Texas. I was really following him, and it was really his prompt. He was like, okay, what do we got to do? What do I got to do to make this happen? And once that happened, everything changed for me. But yes, watching Jim suffer, lose his house, lose his reputation, most of his family turned on him because the media frenzy was crazy. What they were saying about him in the media was nothing what they were actually charging him with, but they were riding that Ponzi scheme wave and just doing all these horrible things. And yet he was like, I don't understand, but I know that God is good. And so witnessing that and watching him hold it together, I just wanted what he was having. And so while he was in jail, before they released him, I married him while he was in jail, which was the creepiest. That's funny. (laughs) And yet... You know, okay, we've established the fact that I can be married and not married. You would think I'd have the ability to say, you know what? Let me know how that works out for you. I will just catch you on the other side. But I felt such compelling love for him. And I wanted to show him that when everybody else is leaving you, I see you. And God was already talking and speaking and working through me. And I know now what First Corinthians means in all those chapters that people read, you know, at their weddings. It's like, no, 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 no. This is what for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and health, good times and bad. This, what I'm walking right now is what that looks like. Yeah, for serious. I don't usually get to ask this question. So you said you got saved sitting on your couch. What does that look like? Was that an instant change for you? Like all of a sudden you're just like, man, I feel different or you knew you were different. It was a process of being different. What did that look like? So I love it when people ask me this, which isn't often enough. So you're probably gonna have to tone me down. Let's so, do it. <laughs> as I told you, God has done so much in me in such a short amount of time. So I could give you story after story after story of amazing, miraculous things that have happened, but I'll just give you a couple. So I was following, you know, Joyce Meyer and following Bill Cornelius. And I didn't really have a church home at the time. And, you know, at the end of his talk, he's like, if you don't know God, you know, let him into your heart kind of thing. So I did that there on the couch. Now, one of the ways or one of the many ways that I know that it was real powerful and it was for me was literally the next morning when I woke up, there were things about me that were completely different. Some of it was how I dressed. One of the main ones was what I looked and liked for entertainment. I got to ask you this. So you said... Because I hate religion, and that's always a big deal for people. They talk about dress or whether they have a drink, all these things. But I feel like you got a different spin on this, and that's why I'm asking. Yeah. You said you woke up, and you feel like dressing differently. Yes. Why? Okay, first of all, I am really into fashion. I love it. I fancy myself pretty cute, whatever. I enjoy clothing. Now, I am Greek. And I don't know what that makes up in your head, but I'm curvy. I'm big busted. I'm all these different things. And I used to be able to rock a strapless dress. Let's just say that. Unlike a lot of people could. (laughs) I have assets that should I choose to enhance, I got it going on. And there was just this thing in me that was just like, eh, I don't need to do that. Like, I just, that's not as pretty to me as it used to be. I don't know. I'm less you know, snooky and I'm a little bit more, I don't know, just covered up modest. and it isn't like modest. That's it. And I'm not like, you know, I won't wear tank tops or something like that. It's not right. that at all. I just didn't feel like the girls needed to be all up out in their glory. And it was just kind of sense of, yeah, you don't need to do that anymore. 
I love that you said that. So it had nothing to do with people saying, oh, you shouldn't dress like that or you oh, shouldn't God, do no. this. It was just like, hey, this is how I feel. And it yeah. was something the Lord did inside of you. Yeah, absolutely. And then again with entertainment. So I used to be a big fan of CSI, all the different crime shows. And you have to understand, I came from a world that was pretty dark and dingy my whole childhood. You know, I'm a girl who lived on the wild side of life. I've never done drugs. I've never been a big party girl because I was so surrounded by that as a child and I was very parentified. So I'm very mature from a very young age, you know, always had jobs, always doing the right thing. So it wasn't like drugs and alcohol were part of my scene. That was a life I was in, but it wasn't who I was. So for me, I liked those edgy crime shows because I was used to grit. You know, I worked in social services. It's like, ah, nothing shocked me. I just started to feel that the glorification of tragedy, it wasn't entertainment to me anymore. And I just was really turned off by those shows. And what I think is so valuable for Phaedra was that it was so significant that I had to attribute that to God. It wasn't Phaedra just maturing or Phaedra just rising above. That was God going, girl, you don't need that trash in your life. And so that was significant enough for me to go, hey, he's real. So those were some of the very first things. And the other really big thing that happened immediately was what I call the garbage story. I was a runner and all of a sudden, all I could see everywhere when I was running was garbage. And I had this, I don't know if it was a voice, I don't know if it was a compulsion or a knowing that I needed to pick it up. And it became this everyday thing. And once I realized that it was God working in me, I started communicating about that. It was like, pick up the garbage, pick up the garbage. And I started resisting it because it's like, all of a sudden I'm running. I've got like old, you know, cigarette (laughs) packets and, you know, McDonald's cups full of all this trash. It was kind of the crux of it was there was a development. It was a housing development that didn't have all the houses built yet that I would go run in and it had really steep hills. It was for very high end homes. And I would run up these different driveways and get myself, you know, more of a challenge. I go up to this big flat and there's booze bottles, used condoms, all this crap everywhere. And I'm like, seriously? (laughs) But miraculously enough, there were trash bags up there. So I'm loading up these old, you know, cheap whiskey bottles because it's all teenagers. And I'm lumbering down this driveway with two big trash bags of garbage. And I'm thinking, God, what is the deal? It was all about obedience, doing what I was told when I was told to do it. And I remember crying out to him, like, I don't want to run anymore because there's so much garbage. (laughs) It was like, just do it when I tell you. One time I picked up a bag in a parking lot. It was full of vomit. Oh, (laughs) so it was the very first time that God was teaching me Phaedra to God learning how to be obedient because I was very independent and I was very sure I knew what I was willing to do and not to do in life. I'm dying laughing because the imagery that I'm getting you picking up trash, I just see some lady like looking outside front yard saying, honey, did we get a new trash woman? Right. That is hilarious. Okay. So there's two dynamics here that I want to jump into you being from a psychology standpoint. Okay. So many people I know when I first got saved, They want to talk you in or out of God. It becomes a head knowledge. And there's a whole psychology. You can get into NLP and all these things that people talk about. But obviously, from a psychology standpoint, you can see that for you, it's been experience, correct? Yes, 100%. My whole journey has been about a personal experience. So nobody could talk you out of these things that have happened, things that you've seen. I mean, I couldn't sit here and talk you out of your faith, right? Because it's been out of relationship and not just going to church or book knowledge or hearing about God. For you, it's been a path of walking with him. Absolutely. In the beginning, I've had the strong knowing I wasn't even supposed to go to church. And maybe that was because I would have been under that influence, but I didn't even go. And then when I did go, I went to the place where I could be the most anonymous because my experience with church, because I had gone to churches when my children were young, because that was kind of tied up to my fence sitting thinking, well, God doesn't love me, but he's going to love my kids. So I'd take them, you know, Bible school and things like that. So I went to churches where I was very anonymous, where I was just there to receive. And I had no sense of, oh, I had to get involved. And I remember this came up recently in a blog for me. I remember going to church, standing there in this 
room where people were raising their hands, which I thought was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen. Bunch of crazy Pentecostals. Right? Yeah. And I'm standing there gripping the chair, rattling off this list to God of things he'll never see of me. I will never raise my hands. I will never even consider being a missionary. I will never be Sister Super Christian. For me, getting back to your point, yes, has been all about experience because what I've gone through with Jim, you know, and we didn't get kind of to where the end all be all was in order for me to walk this walk as powerful and as scary and as real. I mean, this is real, real. I have to know who he is, not who you are or who that church is, because that's not where my strength is coming from. It's literally coming straight from him. And even my husband is like, you know, stuff that even I don't know. And I've been walking this walk forever. And then that's even a little scary. So I definitely am in this experience with the Lord and what he's trying to do in me, which is not what he's doing in you, not what he's doing in my neighbor. I love that you said the reason I brought that up is because I feel like so many people try to rationalize God or they try to have a theory about him or theology, all these different things, but really what it comes down to relationship. And when you come to that place, you talked about obedience. When we're obedient and we're willing to lay down the whys, the ifs, the whats, and all those things and just say, okay, God, if you're really real. And I've told people that too, when I've ministered to them, said, man, if God's real, just ask him and he'll show up. I mean, it doesn't matter what I say or what somebody does. He wants to interact in all of our lives. And if we'll let him, he will. And it's all about, like you talked about, obedience. Mm -hmm. And when he's done with obedience, he'll move on to something else. Exactly. Man, do I got some stories for you on that one, but we don't have time. So, Well, we will on my show. Yes, we'll definitely talk about it. I want to talk about when you realize you were created to do, but I want to put a little bit of a twist on that. So many people want to find purpose. And I've heard it said that your place of pain is your place of rain. And I see that you talked about a little bit of the way you grew up as a teenager. You got into psychology. You wanted to help people. Obviously, you were helping people like you and them not having to go through or get help going through some of the things that you've had to go through. Where do you feel like you were able to find your purpose and what does that look like? I think that it's ever evolving and I think it is for everyone. I don't think that we hit a moment that we're in our purpose and that's what we do for the rest of our lives. And even if we stay in the same genre, I still think that there will be flux within that and the purpose will be even more pinpointed, but it will move about. So initially, yes, I felt my purpose was really to help teens or even parents see themselves in a different way. Parents who are abusers, you know, parents who just didn't know any better than what they were doing to their families. And I felt like that was it. But then with everything with Jim and to just wrap that up, he ended up fighting and going to trial and he ended up losing. And when he lost, they threw the book at him and they gave him 43 years. So essentially, I became a widow without the death. I'm married again. And yet my husband's gone. And now I'm collateral damage because I'm tied to this conviction and everything rained down on me. And I got lost. And I loved God at this point. I'm like, seriously, I like love you. Like, how are you leaving me at this point? How are you taking Making me darker. And what I realized was he isn't. He was rising me to meet his people at a level that only I can at this point, because so few people have gone through a national scandal and been shamed and wrongfully, you know, attacked that there isn't a lot of us out there. And what I've found is that now my purpose, my place of pain and where I'm rain is I am able to help people who are a few steps behind me because I've been walking this walk now for three and a half years. And I'm meeting people who maybe their story isn't the same as mine, but the full range of human emotion is the same. And I have an ability, a humility and a love where I can meet people in a place that I couldn't, even as a great social worker and even as a wonderful mom and even as a great blogger and all those things that I was. Now, not only do I have the practical tools and tactics with psychology background and work thousands of people. Now I have this relationship with Christ where he works through me. And that was denied to every person I'd ever worked with before. Now, not only me, they get the Holy Spirit who works through me. So now I'm working with people who are going through tremendous experiences and I wouldn't have been able to meet them where they were. So it is a bigger shift. Yeah, man, that's a huge shift. Going through everything that you're going through, what do you feel right now is 
within your passion, what you're doing, what do you feel like your biggest strength is? My biggest strength is being able to meet people where they are. I have a way of helping people feel heard who feel like nobody can really relate to what they're going through. And when you meet me, you realize there's probably nothing you're going through aside. There are a few that I just hold as, oh my gosh, I can't even fathom death of a child or certain types of assault. But for the most part, I have an ability to meet people right where they are and allow them to feel heard. And once people feel heard, they're really ready to move on. And I think that's the greatest gift that I bring right now. I love that. Uh, just, I'd say the gift of compassion. It really mm-hmm. is a compassion in the heart of the Lord. Within that, there is a tendency to, your strength can go over too much, over extension of strength. Do you feel like within your strength, there's a weakness? What's interesting is because of my social work background, I have great boundaries, very healthy. I don't adopt other people's problems and I don't let them, I don't become a savior. Mm. So I'm pretty good with boundaries, but I will say I definitely have a weakness after going through this. And my weakness is I can become defensive if I perceive that you're judging or that you're not necessarily believing. So I can easily become defensive. And when that happens, I want to run. That's interesting. I like what you said, though, and it's so important. I think with people that have the gift of compassion, I mean, that really is a gift. But what you said was, is you have to have boundaries. Mm -hmm. And without those boundaries, it's really easy to get run over. Yeah. Then you're just codependent. Yeah. And then you got all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the biggest thing that God is stirring inside of you right now? Mm, I love that. Well, like we said, it was a few years ago. It was all about obedience. Right now, we are very focused on trust, and it's certainly in the area of economics. And I've lived on my own since I was 16. I've always had multiple levels of income. I've been a single person most of my adult life. Even in my married life now, I'm literally single. And I have always relied on my own ability to earn a living. And I've had excess, and I've had not enough, and everything in between. And when I moved here a year ago, I was doing really well and I was super excited. And over this year, things have really changed for me. And normally when that happens, I just step up and start to do more activities, right? More money making activities, what have you. And what's happened is those things have doors have been shutting. And what I realize now is that God is really working on me truly, honestly, without a doubt, believing that all things come from him, not from my own works. And even as though I can say this out loud to you, my flesh is freaking out, (laughs) freaking out because the bank balance says this and I'm putting on the wedding and I'm doing this and I, you know, and rent here is so much more. And I owned a home outright up north. So you can hear how my flesh is just like, ah, but I know that's what he's working on. Thank you so much for being honest. I think so many people just need to hear. That's why I call the podcast, you know, Are You Real and Authentic? Because everyone's going through some level of crisis, whether it's belief or financial or whatever. And so many times I think people just put on that perfect face and we think somebody has it all together, even though things on the outside look great. And it's almost encouraging to hear sometimes somebody else saying, hey, I got the same struggles. We're going through it, too. Well, it's funny. You just brought up the crux of when I speak and work with people, what I say, here's what I know. Everybody is hiding something. And to the extent that they're willing to keep that hidden, they're not able to integrate their professional and personal lives. And I work with people who have spent a lot of money on book coaches, business coaches, marketing coaches, these very specific coaches, and they're still not getting the results that they want. And what I know is that it's about what they're struggling and hiding off duty. And I have to face that myself. I practice what I preach and I am living what I have been asked to walk out by the Lord. And I know that people are struggling, just like you said. Man, that's powerful, Phaedra, what you just talked about. So you got people hiring coaches and all those things. And obviously, because they keep things hidden, it's now not allowing them to access what full purpose of what God has for them because they continue to walk in really hiddenness. Man, that's powerful. I love that. I'm glad. Well, I got a whole teaching on that, that the Lord just really showed me that out of Genesis, that when we decide to walk in truth and really own our crap, and as we walk through that, we really are able to walk in our full purpose because we're not walking in a half truth. We'll be walking in a full truth when we decide to walk with him. So 
Anyways, we can go into that later, but that gets me all excited because I'm off on a whole thing. Okay, so let's jump into the Kung Fu round. Okay. All right. We're all called to share the gospel. It looks different for everybody, depending on gifts, talents. You talk about your podcast. How are you sharing the gospel? Obviously, you're not called to be behind a pulpit. You're not sharing on Sunday. I want to totally get rid of the myth that, you know, we're all called to the ministry, you know, to have to share Jesus or what he's done in our life. How are you doing that? Definitely by hosting people who are speaking their own truth on my show and it's unscripted and it's just as it needs to come and me providing a safe, encouraging space for them to do that. And then me infusing anything that I know or I can contribute to that conversation. Awesome. I love it. What is a personal daily habit that contributes to you having a solid walk? Being alone, I have nothing but time a lot of times. And for me, it is podcasts. If you were to look at my screenshots of the different podcasts I listen to, they're generally faith-based. They're very dynamic. They're not middle of the road. They're not, you know, it's pretty intense. So between the podcasts and also between studying, actually studying the word for myself and having my own experience with it, not just hearing other people telling it to me. Great. What is a recent book that has impacted you that you can share with us? My favorite book I talk about everywhere I go is called God of the Underdogs by Matt Keller. God of the Underdogs. I'm going to write that down and we'll also put it on the show notes as well. Okay, what is a resource that you could share with our listeners that has been helpful for you? For me, podcasts, I know that doesn't sound like much of a resource, but that really is an ability to learn or have experiences wherever you go because they're in your pocket. You can be in your car, you can be mowing the lawn, you could be, you know, cleaning your closet, whatever. So I use podcasts to help teach myself the things that I need to know. I'm right there with you. I probably listen to at least two or three shows a day because the amount of driving I do, Mm -hmm. man, they've made a huge impact for me as well. All right, Phaedra, you've had a little time to prep for this question. Here's the big moment for you. You get to go back and ask the younger you, or you get to see the younger you, and you get to tell yourself whatever you want. What age would you go back to, and what would you tell yourself to prepare you for your future and for what God's called you to? Mm, I would go back to about age 31, which was one of my very favorite years. And I would say that God is real, that the tug that you feel in your heart, that the things that you hear and the things that you see and what you're witnessing in other people, it's all true. It's not a thing. It's a good thing. And that he is real and that I don't have to figure out how to do things on my own, that there is a partner. And even if I don't have a husband, even if I don't have parents, even if I don't have role models, he is there and he wants to build that relationship with you and you don't need to wait an extra 10 years to do that love your answer Phaedra that is a great answer all right so right before we jump into parting thoughts I want to make room for our sponsor when your schedule is as busy as mine seeing a doctor can be very difficult But what if there was a service that can connect you to a U.S. board-certified physician anytime, anywhere? And what if I told you that it's as close and as easy as your telephone? 24-7 MedPlan is an amazing solution that provides telephone access 24-7 between patients and doctors. With medical costs rising and wait times at ERs and clinics getting longer, 24-7 MedPlan allows doctor consults that are on your schedule. What if it's 11 p.m. Saturday night and your child has a fever? Do you go to the ER, endure a three-hour wait, and hundreds or even thousands of dollars in cost? Instead, you can talk live to a medical doctor right then in the comfort of your home, which may avoid a costly visit to the ER. That's peace of mind. Go to 24-7 MedPlan now and register to save time and money and get peace of mind. No deductibles, no contracts, all pre-existing conditions are covered. All for just $29.95 per month for your whole family at 24-7 MedPlan. So go now to Are You Real and click on the banner 247medplan.com and get peace of mind now. All right, Phaedra, before we jump into parting thoughts, I want to give you, I spent time, um, this is something that I've kind of shifted in my show, and you weren't aware of this because I didn't give it to you, (laughs) but what I'm going to do is I have made a habit of my last several guests, I pray for them before we even start, and I want to ask, my thing is I ask the Holy Spirit, I ask God, God, what do you have to say about Phaedra? 
And you ready for this? Oh my gosh, I'm probably going to cry. Okay, you ready? Go mm-hmm. get the tissue, girl. Okay. Phaedra has the gift of healing. You speak into people's lives and you restore what the enemy has taken. Your circumstances will give you more clarity into what the enemy does in people's lives in the spiritual. What is happening to you in the physical is the manifestation of what happens in people's lives every day spiritually. If you will study that and you apply that to people in their lives, it'll change your perception and it'll catapult you into a new dynamic of your business. It will revolutionize your business. You will pave a road for others and they will follow on the way you coach people through God's eyes. Wow. I better get a transcript of that. Yeah, girl. So, that is amazing. I received that. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. So that's what I heard the Lord speaking to Phaedra this morning before we started. So I just wanted to share that with you, and I hope that makes an impact. I hope you feel that. Absolutely, I did. Awesome. Okay, so parting thoughts. Phaedra, I've loved your, man, what you've gone through, your stories, Everything that your life has been in a nutshell has just been, I guess to say where you've come from and where you are is awesome. I love your stories, your faith, your trust, even the fact that you've had to mentally shift where you're at as far as where you've come from. What would be a piece of parting advice because of everything you've gone through in your life that you want to give our listeners? From my heart, the thing that I want to say is stop fighting. Anything that you feel led to change or to get into a relationship with God about, just stop fighting it. Just trust that it is worth it. It will be painful. It will suck. It will cause you to lose things. But everything that you gain out of it will surpass anything you've lost. Just if you can get that stubbornness out of you and just walk towards what he's asking of you, Things will be so much better, so much faster. I love that you said that. I have a saying that says, embrace the suck. And uh, man, I'm telling you, when things just feel miserable, even when I don't feel like going to the gym or running or whatever it is that I don't want to do, I'll tell my kids, we're going to go do it. And they're like, why? Because I don't want to do it. So we're going to do it. (laughs) (laughs) So I love that. What is the best way for our listeners to get a hold of you and check out your podcast ministry? Share all that with us. The easiest thing to do is go to doinglifewithphaedra.com. On the bottom of every single page is a contact me form. I am very quick to respond to people reaching out to me. So go ahead and send me an email. The cool thing is you can get the podcast there. You can find out the different ways that I work with people there. Another thing you can do if you are struggling and you want to stop it, struggling, you can go to crisiscrusher.com. It's a freebie. There's a bunch of downloads. There's some worksheets and it's going to help you if you're in crisis now or be prepared if crisis comes in the future. Yes, I love it. Okay, listeners, if you want to find out more, all the stuff she talked about, I will put that on the show notes page. Phaedra, don't hang up yet. We're not even finished. And the links, everything that you need from Phaedra will be on areyoureal.org. You can type in Phaedra, that's F-A-Y-D-R-A, and also she will be on the feature front page. So check it out, type it in. Listeners, thank you so much for joining in. Phaedra's been awesome. And just remember, be real, be authentic, be you. Jump on our website and check out some of the free stuff that we are giving away. Thank you so much. That's all for this episode of Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You. Be sure to go to areyoureal.org for your free questionnaire to identify your gifts and talents and how you can use them to help people become leaders and catapult them into their destiny to help others become the leaders of tomorrow. We appreciate you spending your time with us and look forward to helping you reach out and revolutionize next time on Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You. 